having a coaching system and being able to be an example that shares well. Show them that there is opportunity that is limitless over here and show that you're here to share well. If the leadership has this attitude, I think we are unstoppable. Dynamic will be only stronger and better. And whatever opportunities comes our way, we're able to conquer as a team. And the same goes to challenges. Kaim, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Let's talk business. Definitely. It's my honor to be here today. And let's have a great conversation about business. Great. So we've known each other for quite some time. Obviously, probably a lot of the listeners have seen some of the stuff that you post on LinkedIn constantly and some of the mastermind groups that you actually participate. We'll get to those questions in, an, in a while. Let's start a little bit of a background. Now, obviously, you're the founder and president of Skyscraper Insurance. Let us know, like, is this the first venture that you had? Did you have any other ventures before? Tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the deep conversation. I like to say that winning feels so great because it's so sweet because it comes with a lot of failures. So it's actually a great question. Sometimes people have a great venture, but people don't realize how much failure it took to lead up to that little success that you have achieved. Mm -hmm. So particularly, I've done a lot in sales, worked for some other companies a little bit for a short while, but particularly before even founding Skyscraper, we have been called for a short period of time. Infinity Insurance, our slogan was Infinite Possibilities. And I always say I went to the most expensive school, trial and error. We were hit with a lawsuit for patent and infringement or from Infinity Insurance, a huge, huge carrier. And that's how we came up with the whole name and trademark. And I learned the right way to have a proper attorney to trademark everything, but it's the name, the slogan, the emblem, the taglines, everything. And we started off Skyscraper for Insurance. It's eight and a half, almost nine years ago. I started off in the kitchen, and then my wife threw me out. And then we of the kitchen, of the kitchen. <laughs> and the business, the business she took out of the kitchen. The rest, the supper, I still eat at the kitchen. And from there, we went into professional office, and the journey began. Beautiful. So, if you could bring us back to those moments, obviously, I think you mentioned something very important, and I think we could all attest to it, which these learning moments and failures. And I think it's important in a journey of a business owner that have gone through their own experience and learning the trade because nobody is handed the silver platter of this is exactly the playbook and this is how you're going to do it. And you have to be ready as a business owner for those those difficult moments in building a business. Like where did this concept of insurance come to play? Like if you could give us a little bit of the insight of it, was it a connection? Was it a somebody telling you, you know, go into that space? Is it something that you had a passion to? So basically I started off the views, it was 2000. 15, from job interview to job interview, trying to get a job. I then moved out of the city and I didn't know a lot of people over here. I was literally ready to do anything. At that point, I was trying to get a job in property management. A lot of my friends, people in my family that were involved in real estate, I wanted to land a job like that. And I think Ben Shapiro said it more on his podcast. That in the event of apocalypse, if you cannot talk, if you cannot talk his way out of the situation, he's good for nothing. So these yeah. people were like, "Are you good at plumbing? Are you handy?" And I was like, I, "I'm not that handy, but I can learn. And whenever I bring the right value for you, we'll reevaluate my pay. I'm ready to train." And they needed someone experienced. So I ended up landing in sales. I did sales for a payroll company. And part of my job in order to land the penny business was a higher ticket item. The insurance part of it, the component of workers' come, because if you run payroll out of time, you get a very, very big penalty by the board of workers' come of the every state accordingly. So I was just trying to help my clients finish a sale and give them a full robust service. So I got involved just onboarding the workers' comp, and I saw that there was so much pain with the workers' comp and the insurance space. So I started working with a lot of individual brokers. Then I started even working with all different payroll companies. At that point, only the global conglomerate like ADP was doing pay-as-you-go, workers count pay-as-you-go. So I went to all the local big community-based payroll companies that a lot of them have 50,000 plus participants, businesses across the country. And I helped them integrate the workers count pay-as-you-go component where it eliminates so much pain, so much more advanced efficiency, human error, and particularly audit, audit consultations. 
I even launched a service, one of my first things when we opened Skyscraper, audit consulting, which is a risk management product, which a lot of accountants, bookkeeping, and payroll companies are using. Then I found myself working in a penny product when I was so much more involved in helping people in the larger product. And that's when I realized I can open an insurance agency, not just helping people with risk count, people full-fledged with their business risk management across their entire portfolio of business, real estate, nonprofits, healthcare, and all the areas that we are expanding and ex continuously keep on expanding. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, it just reminded me a, a very, very something back from a history. I remember that when we started p Group, I remember the good feeling of we're ready for our first employee. And it wasn't a full-timer. It was actually a part-timer. It was actually a family member. He said, you know what? He'll come in a couple of hours a week and you're going to do bookkeeping. That was the first bookkeeper that we, we hired for the company. And I was so excited. I set, I set myself up with payroll checks and everything else, only to find out a couple of, of months later that when I, my accountant, I took an official accountant and they started running my books and I said, you know what? You need to have workers camp. And I and it didn't have. And as soon as they filed for workers camp, I got a penalty. I still remember $16,500 for every day that didn't have workers camp when I started. And I always use this as an example. Sometimes you go into business, you don't know everything, uh, but it still shouldn't, you know, today, I think there's so much more knowledge available, so much more people ready to help you out and support you in your journey. So that's amazing. So going we, back we to say it, it's stunning moments, like if you look back on it, all of these moments, now we're looking at, wow, it's mm -hmm. it was so mm -hmm. simple, but in that moment, it was a, it was a, it was a huge learning experience, correct? So I very much appreciate uh, the part that you mentioned about the, how you got into the industry, because what you mentioned something I think our, our listeners should take note is that you saw, first of all, you saw two things. You saw value you could bring to the marketplace, and I think it's an important part because we see a lot of people go into the industry, they see maybe a friend or somebody that's successful and say, you know what, I could do the same thing. And all they want to do is do the same thing and try to get the same results. Versus even if you could see a friend or somebody in an industry, you could ask yourself, how can you be a little different, bring a little bit different value to, to the marketplace? You mentioned it with the auditing part. I think adding another value, all of, all of a sudden, you're opening up a new market for your product. That's one thing I, I took out from what you said. Another thing for our listeners to take note is, you mentioned about you were in an industry that was a penny business and you wanted to see where is there, could you follow a larger amount of money? And I have answered this question many, many times when people will show me a business plan or, or go through what they're, they're doing in their business and they're not making enough. And I always tell them, look, it could be a good small business for you. The question is, is it worth all the effort you're putting in for the, this amount of results that you're getting? Maybe if you put in the same amount of effort in, some, in a different industry, you could get so much more in return. And I, I think a lot of business owners don't ask the, this question. They don't ask themselves this question enough. I wouldn't advise people to have to ask the question every day because you can't focus on your business. But let's say every few years, ask yourself, are you maximizing? Are you putting in the effort? Is it bringing it to the right results? Or maybe there's a different service or a different, you know, how you could pivot your business to a different. And in your case, it was from workers' comp to a property and casualty or whatever it is to say, I already have the knowledge, I already have the relationships, I could just offer other products that could bring me more results. So I appreciate the way you said it because I think there is a learning more, there's learning there for our listeners. Let's speak about the industry of insurance and then we'll speak about you growing your company. The industry of insurance is a space and you've seen it a lot and I've seen some of the posts about sometimes people will try to have insurance because they have to have insurance, but ultimately they don't get the right coverage and they don't get the proper coverage. And unfortunately, when you need to use the insurance, then you find out, well, you wanted to save on premiums, but now you're not covered or you're not covered enough and so on and so forth. From your experience dealing with so many, so many policies, what can you share for our listeners, business owners that have insurance policies, what they need to be aware of when looking at their own policy? So basically, back to what you said, having a perfect business plan, knowing where you're going and like we say, let the past predict the future is a very important thing. The way I, I myself and the way our team looks on our clients. So a lot of people and a lot of companies in the industry, competitors, so-called competitors, they're writing policies. It's, a, it's another customer to the file cabinet. We try to create relationships and clients by really understanding their vision and their mission statement and protect what they are building 
for tomorrow can understand where they're coming from in order to get there. So, of course, whether you're a new contractor getting your first job in order to submit the first bid, you need the right certificate of insurance. There's job requirements. Sometimes if there's costs that you cannot afford it, then you need to finance the plan. Or whether it's someone closing his building and you need to meet the bank requirements. So there is your own requirements, know what you want to protect, and also meeting the requirements of others, whether it's city, state, local government, municipal bonds, whatever it takes to meet all the parties involved in that transaction. I sometimes have very, very large groups coming over to us, big petroleos, and they're coming for their next acquisition to us. And they're like, I want this and I want that. And I'm like, are you going to go to lending from the bank? And I'm like, okay, so put us right away in touch with your bank because unfortunately, you're not the one calling the shots over here. We need to deal with your bank direct. And if you are hiring us to get you to a clear to close, should it be any issue at the closing table? Part of our job is taking over that communication, that headache from you. And of course, we can negotiate with the banks that should make sense. The call shouldn't be above that it needs to be. We try to reason with them, but we're right away want to have a seat at the table, just like your lawyer, your accountant. The same way we come in during the diligent period and we really represent you and advocate for you the best of your bottom line. So let me ask a follow-up question to that is, you know, there's industries where the product is, you know, we always we always say there's a want and there's a need, yeah? You want to be in an industry that there's a need, which means is that not just I want to have it as a luxury product, I need it, and therefore, but in your case, sometimes it's a need not even dictated by yourself. It's dictated, like you just said, by a bank or by a landlord. You have to have insurance and so on and so forth. How could you bring your passion to the industry and how could you motivate your client base? Yes, I want to do this. And yes, let's do this. Let's write, write, let's sign that policy, so to speak. Let's bind that policy. Like, how do you, I know that you're a guy with passion and that you're building your company with passion, but how do you connect the dots that, that your client should feel that passion the same way? So it's a great question. And uh, sometimes I was by a very prominent developer and I was in his office and he said, I wish you sold me chandeliers like that. I can see you're selling me these plans that are like like for unwanted activities. It's like the evil it's the evil necessary. Yeah. Like, I wish you'd have sold me something that I could look and look at it every single day, have it in my dining room. So mm -hmm. it's a great question. What we are really selling is risk management. The first portion of risk management is the transfer of risk to a contract. Meaning to say the insurance policy is just a contract that they will undertake the risk, particular clauses that it's outlined on the, over there, and, in, and it's included that in case of that like unwanted moment, we are already here predicting well to make sure that uh, you, your financial status doesn't get affected, that you're fully, fully in full capacity after loss, just like it was before the loss. And in that case, that's the first portion of risk management. It's the policy, but the bigger picture, the vision of risk management is literally protecting hopes, dreams, businesses, the livelihoods of people, and knowing that we are there to literally protect and, and predict well and advise them well and really, really give them an educated budgetary decision that makes sense for their business plan is what gives us purpose and joy. Helping eliminate risk that stands in the way, blockages that business owners or building owners may not see today. But unfortunately, if people took those shortcuts, we know from the past what are brought to them. So if we can protect a new generation or a new company or a company starting off or even an ongoing company going from mid-size to a larger level, I'll give now an example that came into us literally yesterday over the weekend. A friend of Florida calls me up. There's a big plan. He's 15 years doing gelati, some dairy type of product uh, manufacturing in Florida. He did a merger and acquisition where he bought in with another company. And because of the new, the powers, the magic, the dynamic of both of them, they came up with a particular product that landed them a contract from Hershey's. Hershey's chocolate. So this mm -hmm. small mom pop shop grew. I'm literally, I looked on their payroll records. They grew from being $300,000 in payroll in a span of seven months to above. 4.5 million of payroll. They have 130 employees now as we speak as of today. They went from small to large wow. so quickly. Now what happened is they have 15 years of clean lawsuits, no claims. And now all of a sudden they have a pattern of repetitive claims. 
So they got kicked off their insurances. They called me over the weekend. We were helping them as we speak right now to fix the whole setup, stop the bleeding. But what really caused them to be in this situation? Because their infrastructure wasn't healthy enough, having a proper HR process, risk solution process, crisis management process, documenting a claim with the first few seconds, I always say, the way it's reported, the way it's documented internally is the outcome for the next two years or seven years in state court. <laughs> Litigation mm -hmm. is an extra podcast for itself. But yeah. we need to say, being in that position, helping this company grow to the dream that they always wanted to be and now protect their future is, is real purpose because they see they are, they are now in vain. So we're helping them, of course, find new coverage, but what caused them to be at that level? And most of the agencies and brokers don't have the component of risk management to help build out a risk solution services that literally uh, prevents of these claims of happening. There are so many safety situations, customized risk management plans, and particularly above all the policy that helps employers and employees have a cohesive work environment, with peace of mind, coming in, clocking in and clocking out every day with the teamwork of positivity, knowing that the employer and the employees are happy. Beautiful. Um, let me ask you, going back to the, the insurance question. So let's say people listening to this episode as we speak, where are the places where you say that when you review a policy, you find those loopholes or a lack of coverage or whatever it is that business owners usually try to get a good quote on binding a policy, but didn't realize if a push comes to shove and they need to use the policy, that's where those exclusions are. So first of all, it starts off with the opportunity to be able to find yourself a trusted advisor, to be able to delegate. A lot of business owners, they micromanage too much. They, just like I'm not an expert, there's so many different things, and I like to delegate and find myself an expert that I can rely to trust on. I currently have seven different legal lo lawyer professionals in different categories when it comes to insurance litigation, to be able to help my clients and be able to advise for ourselves how to structure things as a business. There are certain things that we have in so many other areas, whether contracts, different states. You need to find yourself an expert and be able to delegate. Sometimes people think they have cyber availability. It's included in my package. Or people think they have because they are so-called expert and also they didn't really give over the trust and delegated the trust to someone that they trust. And even the people that are appointed in that position don't gain from them their full trust. They're still hiding out. They have a little bit over here and a little bit over there. So I think it's important to share and have a discovery poll with every client to understand what is their business all about? What is it exactly that they're doing? So many times there's miscommunication and classifications on clients are completely off. And it's not the competitor's fault. It's sometimes the client's expressions. They, he didn't express or specify it well. Sometimes I have people manipulating the answers because they think this will make it more expensive. They're like, if I answer this, will this be more expensive or that? I would say, you answer us exactly what is it that you're doing, and it's our job to come back with the best possible solutions. Exactly. We work for you. We advise for you. So it's important to, in a nutshell, is first give us the full picture. Once you have the full picture, sometimes you have people having five different plans on five different areas, and if somebody has a bird's eye view, Sometimes you can bulk things up, you can make blanket limits, you can do an umbrella on liability, you can do so much more by helping and bringing together all the missing loose ends. Then there is so many misclassifications and exclusions that you always should make sure that you are protected or educated to what you're buying, that if you're getting some, something for significant cheaper, that's okay, but know the risks that you enter in. And I'll finish with this, the biggest risk takers are the ones that know back end the calculated risks behind them. They know that they're taking a risk, but they know what they're taking. The dumbest risk takers are the ones that are like, okay, they're going to jump in because I got it for three cents cheaper or for thousands of dollars cheaper. But well, I don't know what they're getting into. What's behind it? The actuarial report that goes in that drives those numbers up and down, at least make sure that you got what's behind those numbers. Yeah, the, this is the definition of a calculated risk. Calculated risk means that I've calculated the risk and I decided to take it or not to take it. Exactly. You can be more bold. That's what I'm saying. You can be a risk taker. and We're okay. We will just want to make sure you know the facts before you jump in and not learn it the other way around. 
I want to go back to you're building your own company. Obviously, you started off solo, and now you have a sales team, and you have in, in multiple states. Tell us a little bit about the growth of the company as far as the structure of the company, as far as building a sales team and so forth. So first of all, I'm excited to share, and I don't even know where to start, but what I have in me is the need to aspire. And I think for anyone in any company, it's important to be living inspirations for your team. Now, you don't need to be the smartest person. And I, of course, say I try not to be the smartest person in the room. I always yeah. want to have people in the room that have a smarter opinion than myself. And, and I want to speak last and help conclude and build a bigger vision with them. So it's, it's of course, to have a cockpit of a dream team. But in leadership, it's our biggest job to be inspiring. They say if your circle doesn't inspire you, you're in the wrong circle. So yes. Being able to inspire and building a team, and particularly when I go into the city of Manhattan, I walk through those blocks and I see these gigantic businesses and buildings. What inspires me is that such small people are able to build such bigger things than themselves. So I want to build something much bigger than myself. And how do you see? It's only done with teamwork, with a culture that inspires and is positive because nobody likes to prove. You have situations where you can have the best vision, the best plan. And we know our problems, but we're looking for solutions. So we don't need someone to just dwell on the problem. We need someone that is able to dwell on the solution. So sometimes you can have the smartest person. He can meet so much, but he can still be a killer for a team. Because sure. that's something that you need to be able, as a leadership, to point out. And also, like I always say, the worst thing is to be ordinary. You got to strive to be extraordinary. So how do you bring it all together? You got to have positivity and also have the opportunity of being a giver. You got to be able to share the wealth. Producers and sales, producers in our industry and salespeople in our what we call the sales manager, we provide the number one coach, which is the global sales director. And what gets certain teams to go get to the big leagues to win a championship, you can have the same athletes playing on two different teams. What gets out to bring home all the points for the team is the coach. He coaches them all throughout the season and gets them through those difficulties and helps them set their goals so they have clarity on their vision. So having a coaching system and being able to be an example that shares well. Show them that there is opportunity that is limitless over here and show that you're here to share well. If the leadership has this attitude I think we are unstoppable. Dynamic will be only stronger and better. And whatever opportunities comes our way, we're able to conquer as a team. And the same goes to challenges. And when you limit those, all the, if you go the opposite around, which is the negative of it, the negative example of it, it drives speculation in the team. It drives people apart and it makes them question every day. Am I in the right environment? Is this too toxic for me? Will, if I want to achieve these numbers that I want to achieve, will I be able to get it according to my contract? Show that you're here to give and share and be part of something. Big. It's very important what you just shared. And I, I appreciate the way you shared it because I think this is the, you know, the definition of a good leader. Because a good leader doesn't mean a, somebody that has all the answers. And a good leader doesn't mean somebody that will always cover for you. But... A good leader is somebody that will inspire you. And I think it's important as leaders, we should ask ourselves every single day, have we inspired our team today? And I'll just go even a step further. And I, I'm going to ask you the question, which is building a good culture means having a leader that inspires. And it's important that a leader should really dedicate time in their calendar, how they're doing it, where they're doing it, what programs they have, what type of training do they give their team? It's not just something that I should feel good. Yeah, I think I'm an inspirer. I think people look up to me and people learn from me because I walk through the hallways and I speak to a couple of people in the kitchen while I'm making a coffee. You need, really need to put the effort and not only put in the effort, put in the time, which is actually in your calendar. So I guess my question to you is, what could you share publicly things that you're doing on a daily basis that you're spending time to actually inspire your team? So it's a great question because sometimes we live in our heads. We think we're doing things perfectly, but it's important to collect feedback, how the people on the receiving end are feeling. So it's very, very important to build a feedback reporting system that is consistently, whether it's through team meetings, 
or various different methods. There's so many things these days like EOS and so many things that teams can do. We have done EOS and it's been amazing for us. But having that team lead meeting and meeting with the leaders of every team once a week and asking those questions that we're focusing on. First of all, are we giving the technique for our people? Are we giving them enough of the tools that they're able to scale? Sometimes you demand from them so much, but you're not giving them the opportunity to win. Are we giving training that is perfect? And say the last quarter is when we finished a whole new setup of point all of our training system. We have a whole onboarding process from a personality test to a knowledge test to the onboarding experience, to the training experience, which is with the particular trainer and a system and a software that tells you exactly where you're up to and you can rewatch those sessions. Then having weekly meetings with mid-level management and getting feedback where everybody can really speak open and honest. And when we say open and honest, it's open to other people's opinion. And either they, they're not the same as yours. That's what open-minded means. Sure. And honest, really knowing that when you walk out of the meeting that you shared everything in a professional manner. So that's the idea. We have a report system. We are able to see a lot. And of course, you can build it into team building exercises where we do a lot of, like some people say, okay, I do parties, I do this, I do that. We do all of it, but it needs to be a physical reporting back system where you can learn. And I found myself things that I never knew about myself, which I needed to work on. And it feels good that I did those. I worked on myself to be better for my people and for myself. And I can say my work-life balance and my communication is so much better now with my team. So working on yourself and showing that you're putting in the effort goes both ways. Accountability is for us as leaders. And the same, the same as accountability you demand from them, we should demand our, from ourselves. Let me ask you a follow-up question is, because you mentioned also EOS before, there's something about, we hear a lot, um, obviously we spoke about culture, and you mentioned about parties. Obviously, when we speak about good culture, people confuse it with perks. And perks are, there's a time and place for perks, and there's also a time and place for a great culture. And a culture, great culture means a culture of excellence, a culture of growth, growth-minded individuals, a place where people could learn and, and be open and honest, as you mentioned before. I guess my question to you is, I hear a lot of leaders that they have this issue. If I want to be a great leader, I want to be very good to my employees. But then it's contradicting with accountability. It's a very fine line when I hold somebody really accountable, brutally accountable on, on, as far as because they didn't reach their targets or they didn't do the work as according to the, what the company wants from them. How do you wrestle with, yes, I want to have a great culture. I want to be great with a great relationship with my employees, but yet at the same time, I want to hold them accountable. So accountability goes both ways. Accountability goes, of course, by meeting uh, your goals and what's expected, but also accountability goes to be accountable for the credit too. So first of all, leaders, they use the word accountability only when it's in a difficult situation. They forget to recognize excellence. And that's so, so important. Being able to call out excellence and have a system where you literally reward on excellence on people that are together as a team, know what's demanded from them, and they stand out. Pull that out. At the same time, if you have a fast-paced, high-dynamic culture that everybody is on the same page and moves along at the same speed, that's a good leader to put together those teams. And you have someone that's slacking on that. Usually, if somebody wants to be with that same fast speed, he will come. He or she will come to that leader and say, "I feel maybe what I have going on is too much for me. Maybe I need a different position." They feel a little bit left out. If you build that culture where everybody's moving on the same tone of speed, excitement, and you have someone that wants to ruin that, they will always automatically resign on their own because they feel they're not a fit. Or someone that really wants to become better will come more in an exercise of help. So the accountability that becomes brutal is by ignoring the red flags. If you see within a certain period or a certain milestone, milestone in, in that someone on your team is not cut out for this, for this and doesn't have the capacity, Sit down with them one on one, and rather than criticize, coach them how they can be better in their job. Most of us as leaders sometimes we're so frustrated, and we take the time to criticize and criticize when the person already knows the problem. Now, what I need is a solution. They come to you for solutions. Now, if that solution can be made in that meeting. Both of you will walk out like so exhilarated. But if it's spent time to criticize and criticize, 
obviously both will not be happy and the environment will be a little bit uh, tarnished. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think uh, it's a very important point, you know, open and honest and being able to have a, a, a feedback loop, so to speak, is very important. And what we see a lot with leaders, and I think you mentioned it before, and I think it's a very important point to note is that you mentioned EOS before, and I know one of the exercises EOS has sometimes is everybody giving feedback for everybody in the room, and including Correct. even if you're the boss, the founder, the CEO, whatever it is. Now, it's one, one thing of getting that feedback. It's the second thing working on, it's it's something totally different working on you, on the feedback you got. And it's something totally different actually asking your own team members in a month from then, am I doing better on that, on that feedback? And I think it takes a humble leader for the success of their own, their own good and their own personal development and the company's uh, um, success to actually go the extra mile and actually ask their team members, have you seen me change a little bit in, in X, Y, Z and based on the feedback there was. And I think that comes from a humble place, but it comes also from somebody that is able to look at the bigger picture. What ends up happening is they know if this is the type of leader I'm going to be, people will want to stay in my company. People will want to refer other people to come work for this company. So there is a selfishness in this as well. Outside of your own personal growth, if you really are looking for the bigger picture, the success of your company, you see sometimes successful companies that can't hold employees. Every few, there's like almost like a wash machine. Every few months, people are coming in and leaving, and they don't realize how much money that's costing the company of training new people, onboarding new people, and then letting them go, and so on and so forth. So there's something about understanding, even if you're not doing it for your own personal growth and your own personal development, you as a leader have that, you need to do that for the success of the company, have that responsibility to do that for the success of the company. I want to turn to another part of the conversation that I want to get to, I remember we met at one of the shows where we actually scheduled this interview and you mentioned to Florida. me that in Florida. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned to me that that you're starting a new venture called Dynasty Insurance Capital. And I'm not sure if it's fully public, if what you could share, but if there's anything you could share for our audience to understand outside of the, the existing skyscraper insurance, what are you doing with that? So my model was always in skyscraper insurance and what we have built was to I always looked on it. I can help X amount of people a day, but building a team, building a team of experts, and of course, they will make a beautiful living by working with Skyscraper. We can help not just one person, we can help a village. So why help one person when you can build a platform that can help an entire village? So that's what we have done with Skyscraper Insurance, and the idea is to have everywhere risk exists, we want to have an expert to ensure it. And by being such a person that always searches to scale and do more, and always want to push my boundaries, we went into different places, different states. We grew, we opened more offices, and we also have done three successful acquisitions over the last couple of years. And we started doing acquisitions um, over the last uh, year and a half, and we always wanted it to do it, but we weren't like ready yet because our infrastructure needed some help, and we wanted to replicate success once we know we're set up shop in a healthy way and have processes and procedures that work as well. So now that we're doing acquisitions, we have certain models and the vision of Dynasty Assurance Capital is we want to be able, just like we help one, one person, the idea of the village, and we have done it here in this amazing community, we want to go out there and help so many more communities go from good to great. And we are walking into areas where there is so many beautiful communities across our country, whether it's the, the Latin professionals, the Asian professionals, there are certain community-based businesses that there's such a strong culture over there, and we're amazed by what they're doing, but with our help of bringing better systems, technology, and always try to study, I speak to these ownerships, what worked till now, and what didn't work, and where I can come in, and whatever worked that help that grow even better, what they don't work potentially bring solutions and work together with them. And I try to keep them on, just build stronger and better by acquisition. So our organic growth is growing in skyscraper, but there are certain cultures and communities, no matter how much advertisement or how much money you spend, the only way you can come in over there is to non-organic growth by buying and doing it. So mm -hmm. buy very humbly a ticket to the table to acquisition. And I literally work with ownership and that whole team to just replicate the success 
and, and grow stronger and better. And I utilize and I pivot off a lot of ideas that we learn in skyscraping. And sometimes you have these years of intelligence that these people give you, human intelligence, that I'm able to learn from them. So when we combine our youth and fast-paced and technology base together with that, and you're open to learn from that from, from generations before, from years of experience, you bring that all together in a room, then you have answers to everything. It's, I always say this industry, it's so complex. Nobody can answer you everything. But if you build a team, a team together has the access for everything. That's how we're building it. Because sometimes a dynasty insurance acquisition shall need help in a particular region that we have from other sister companies. We are now able to get the answers for everyone, share posts, and bring up the profits for mm. everyone about. And I, are you planning to, those acquisitions to stay with their own name and their own in their own markets? It's not like acquisition and then folding it into a skyscraper. Correct. So if it has a brand going for itself and it's recognized, the local public school they they already are known for donating every year a certain amount, then they're known in their community. I just want to help that brand brand grow and 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 blossom stronger. If their brand is lacking that moment doesn't give the right messaging, that's when we will discuss a rebrand or potentially using our operating company, Skyscraper, to operate that company. It's lacking that, that part. Got it. I want to ask you um, a question about, we mentioned it before, um, about, I know on LinkedIn, you post a lot about you're part of Mastermind. What's your take about the power of Mastermind and what can you share as far as what it does for you as a business leader? So particularly the group that we're doing now for three and a half years, which consistency is key. So many people start things. And I'm also a person that every day comes in with hundred new ideas. And I, <laughs> I get the idea of start, but I really got to thank all the group members, part of our team, that we're consistent and we hold each other accountable every month when we meet to really, really bring the maximize the value out of the group. And particularly what you will find, I'm the youngest person in that group, so I'm really honored to be among such big professionals that have built giant businesses. I'm, I'm completely grateful that I was invited into that group and I'm able to bring value to my capacity that I can bring. And I continue to look always, how can I contribute value to the bottom line of my people here, my people in those groups, my clients? That's how, how can I bring value? That's my approach to everything. If I cannot bring value, I cannot sell. I can only sell if I'm confident in my mind that I can really help. So nice. first of all, I was able to gain from a mastermind. I think any professional is able to gain. Sitting around other leadership positions, people in leadership, people, business owners, that go through certain challenges, it's like a complete therapy session knowing that you're not alone. The corporate executives in America the, and, and the entrepreneurs, if you like them both in the two separate conference rooms, the people that are been like wheeled into this corporate America silver platter, they're all talking about their accomplishments and about their latest vacations. You go to the next room of the entrepreneurs, you hear them beating each other up, how they're not happy and they need to do more. And they're like struggling. You think they're going out of business tomorrow. They're always like, so when you take those people, you put them into a room. And they can talk to each other and he or her has a problem with this and he or her has a solution for this. It, it, it's a real therapy session. It's number one. Number two, by working together, I found that so many collaborative marketplaces and new opportunities that was open for our clients as joint ventures. Because we have so many industries that go hand by hand with each other's. And the clients carry the entire communication component that we can do a robust service for a client, having the resources and being able to help them and guide them. And hey, you need a lawyer to represent you in Tennessee. I have this and this amazing guy. He's able, he knows the, the, the walks of the land. Having those resources, and sometimes people say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So the sure. who is a very important. And number three, we literally also send a lot of referrals to each other that are healthy, good referrals. And since we know each other so well, we know who our ideal client for us are and what type of referral each of us will love. So with those three components, I think we're winners. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I've, I've been part of masterminds for years and different masterminds on different topics. Some of them leadership, some of it just marketing knowledge. And the power of being together in a room of like-minded individuals is nothing could train you and give you the knowledge the versus getting the collective knowledge. And 
the accountability part as well, because keep, you know, you mentioned before about the two rooms. I always say this, entrepreneurship is very lonely. Being on the top is very lonely. You could have a team of 30, 40, 50, 100 employees. When you sit in that closed room and you have this list of very important things you have to get through, HR issues, growth issues, planning, financial, so whatever, whatever issues comes up in every industry has, every business has, and every industry has their own challenges. And sometimes you just are, are very lonely making those decisions, even if you have a great leadership team, but sometimes not everything is you could share with your own team. When you have a, a soundboard of a mastermind of people that you could share ideas, hold each other accountable, it's priceless. And I've spent thousands of dollars in my career for masterminds. I've hosted certain masterminds in the past. And all I could say is that it's amazing that you're holding it together for so long. But it's amazing, and I would just encourage everybody, if you took out of this conversation, a couple of things that I took out is, obviously, you mentioned early on the coaching system for salespeople, because that's also something we see so many great people enter the sales force, and they fall out pretty quickly, and not because they're not good salespeople. They just didn't have the infrastructure and the sales support in order to become great salespeople. And the same is with business entrepreneurs. Sometimes they fall out. They have a great idea, great business just don't have an infrastructure of sharing ideas and accountability. So that's, that's amazing. Where could people find out more about you? Before you conclude, I want to touch sure. one place on that because sure. I think this can really help people. Sure. What gets me through the darkest times and why, like Tom said, it's build a light bulb and he tried 999 times till he found, I think, the thousand times. People ask him, why do you give up after three times, four times? People give up after two times trying, 80, 90, 100 times, he said, I didn't fail. I never failed. I found 999 ways that doesn't work. So I literally have that concept and I see it every day. People fall out because they're missing a lack of vision or their vision is clouded. It's clouded. So I remember years ago, I used to walk up every Friday so in pain because I wanted to already be here and I didn't see myself anywhere. And the second I was able to get with my team on the same page and build the vision. Now, even though I'm going through the same tough times, I can take punches because I know there's light at the end of the time. So whether you're a leader, you're a salesperson, you're an executive, a business owner, if you don't have a business plan with a clear vision and milestones, how to get there, you're always going to be like so frustrated. If you are seeing yourself getting there and you hit a dead end, you just got to reroute, but we're going still for the big picture. That's how you can get to that lonely top that you spoke about. Exactly. So, we call it uh, clarity. If you have vision, but you have clarity, uh, it's amazing because you as a leader will not do everything, as you mentioned. You want to be able to grow a team, and the team will be part of executing your vision. A lot of people in your team don't have the bandwidth to think alongside you on the vision. But if they have clarity of what steps they could do to support your vision, they'll do amazing work. So the clearer you are with your vision and the clarity you have to, that you could project to your team, then all of a sudden you have a, a full picture puzzle because everybody will do their part. And I think what you mentioned is very important. And ultimately, that's how businesses are built successfully. So I, I appreciate that, that note. And that's so, our flow. We share your vision for a better tomorrow. I try exactly. to understand your vision, where you want to be tomorrow. Most of the people don't see that today. I see where you're going. I know you're now this little guy or, or medium and you want to go to large. Where do you want to go and how can we be part of that growth, that Amazing. success journey? And if you need to take failure in between, we can also be there to hold your hands and get you through those challenging moments because a lot of them has to do with litigation, insurance, and a lot of other stuff. That's what we try to do. So Amazing. Uh, yeah. So where could people find out more, more about you and or more about your company? Okay, listen, you can find us anywhere by searching chaimberkovic.com, chaimberkovic on LinkedIn, skyscraperinsurance.com, and as well on LinkedIn, on all social media platforms, and as well on Dynasty Assurance Capital, which is uh, being built now, is already available on LinkedIn, and will be also on our website very, very soon. And we look forward to con continuously being inspiring, being able to bring value to many, many communities near you, and being able to be the global conglomerate of a one-stop shop that will have the answers as a team to everything that you're looking for risk-related.
For the links to resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptechgroup.com slash podcast, where we'll link to find Chaim on LinkedIn. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes, let's do this. Number one, a book that changed your life. Good to great. Great book. One of my favorite. Number two, a piece good of advice. Great. Good is not great. Exactly. We always say like good isn't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just mentioning that I have a top ten um, book list, and that's that's part of my top ten book list for any business owner. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you never forget: stay consistent. Success, like Winston Churchill says, success was built from going from one failure to the other failure without losing enthusiasm. If it was, yeah, if it would have been so like easy, everybody would have done it. Stay consistent. consistent. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. I want to go back with this mindset back in Yoshido in school. I want to do that again. Okay, that's good. Then last and final question, what's still in your bucket list to achieve? Being everywhere, accessible to everyone and relatable to everyone. Beautiful. Chaim, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Like, always a pleasure. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you.